start right now. Chris, okay. go ahead. Hello, everybody. Welcome back another, uh, to another edition of iConnex. Today, we have, of course, already uh, uh, a very excellent speaker. And this month, we had already very good speakers and uh, all related to soft matter. But I will be today's moderator. My name is Christian Nijhuis. I'm a professor at the University of Twente, uh, specialized in hybrid materials for optoelectronic applications. And I will be your host uh, for today. I already mentioned that today's seminar uh, falls in a series of soft matter. And early this month, we already had excellent contributions from Australia, from Dragomir Nesev. He talked about tunable dielectric meta surfaces. Last week, we had Aaron Wheeler from the University of Toronto. And he talked about microfluidics for chemistry, biology, and medicine applications. Next week, uh, we have also a fantastic speaker Xibing Pei uh, from UCLA, and he's an expert in, in stretchable, flexible uh, electronics. I'm also very much looking forward to it. But today, uh, we have a contribution from Rong Cheng. So this is the team today. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I will be the moderator. I already mentioned quickly uh, today's speaker, Rong Cheng. But we have a special guest uh, panelist, uh, Hugo Duan, another panelist from Thailand, Vibo Pia Batanamate, if I hopefully pronounce it correctly. And we have an ex challenger, uh, Hangzhou Wang. And yeah, this is today's speaker, Rong Cheng from Huzhou University. She is a full professor uh, and she has a really long uh, resume, but let me just give you uh, the most important things. Uh, CCPI for key national projects uh, founded by the, uh, yeah, supported by the uh, Science Foundation of China uh, and national BSEC research programs and the team leader of uh, the innovation team of the Hubei province. Her research focuses mainly along and around atomic level manufacturing, atomic level deposition. And I think that will also be uh, uh, the topic of today's talk. Uh, she has been uh, editorial members uh, of quite a few different uh, journals and also has been a recipient of yeah, quite a few uh, awards. Uh, but I think the most notable one is the Distinguished Young Investigator uh, Award of the Chinese Frontiers of Engineering and Science and Technology. Uh, the first prize of Technical Invention Award of the Hubei province and the Hubei Province Intellectual Property Award. Um, let me go now on, move on to a panelist. I know him uh, quite well because we both uh, were uh, before in, in Singapore, uh, but Huang Duen is already since 12 for 12. Uh, uh, in, uh, he moved back uh, to China and there he is now uh, the director of the Greater Bay Area Institute for Innovation at the Hunan University and the vice director of the National Engineering Research Center for high energy, uh, for high efficiency grinding. Um, I know him uh, quite well and he has been active in many different area, areas of research, all somehow related to extreme engineering and manufacturing. But before uh, he went back to China, he has been uh, in quite a few different places. Uh, he has been a visiting scientist at uh, MIT, in IMRI, ASTAR in, in Singapore, but also in Germany, in the University of Stuttgart. Well, he published a lot of papers. Uh, he has a lot of citations. He's doing extremely well. Uh, but uh, I think notable is that he is also the founder of micro nano manufacturing at Microsystem Technology Research Center at Hunan University. Then we also have a panelist uh, from Thailand, uh, Wee Bo. Uh, and when I read his resume, what really stood out to me is that he's one of the founding fathers of the Global Young Academy. Uh, and I think that is a pretty nice uh, global initiative. Uh, and in 2013, at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, he was also recognized as one of the 40 top scientists. So I think that really is, uh, uh, yeah, summarizes already uh, uh, how important he is and his 
tremendous contributions to, to science in general. Yeah. And then as a challenger today, as the ex-challenger today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Wang. He did his PhD at MIT, and he's currently a postdoc at Caltech, and he's also an expert in atomic layer deposition. So now I would like to give the floor to Rang, and we are all looking forward to your talk. Okay. Okay, so see my slide very well. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction. And also thanks to Alice for organizing and also inviting me uh, for this, um, this, this great honor to present on the ICONX Talks platform. So as introduced to the title of my talk here today is a controlling atomic placement in nano manufacturing. So we all know that more than half a century ago, the Nobel laureate, Professor Richard Feynman, made a famous speech that there's a plenty of room at the bottom. It has been considered as the birth of nanotechnology. And in his talk, he mentioned that ultimately in the great future that we can arrange the at atoms the way we want. And interestingly, just uh, before his talk, 1959, Jack Kilby from uh, Texas Instruments, as shown here, and also Robert Noyes of Fairchild. They both independently invented the first integrated circuits. Although it's just a few resistors, capacitors, the inventions made the technology of the information age feasible. And we can see like through the Morse law, it's just continuous growth and uh, Finally, right now, we are going to enter the Astrum era as shown from the Morse Law's uh, progress. So uh, the Astrum era is coming. Because of that, to make this happen, the manufacturing methods has to be in the atomic and close to atomic scale. So here I have two like cartoons. The last one is atomic layer deposition, basically based on the surface functional groups you can grow uh, like um, this kind of sequential surface limiting reactions grow layer by layer. And on the right is actually the atomic layer etching. Basically, they form similar way, based, uh, you form surface limited reactions, but uh, the byproduct will just goes away and you also have the conformal. So these two atomic layer processes share some similarities. They both conformal, uniform, and you can control them down to the astron scales. So having said of that, I basically um, have this process showing you. You have the AOD is like two precursors that react with the surface um, separately entering to reactor. And similarly, when you have this AOE, you also have this like two processes separately entering to the reactors. After talking about the background, here comes the outline of my talk today. So today I will first spend a few, um, first part of my time to talk about the selective atomic layer deposition because we are talking about the atomic placement. So this process enables additive processes. And also we expand the process from the flat surfaces to the nanoparticles. In the second part of my talk, I will talk about atomic level processes for several emerging applications, including like the displays, photovoltaic, as well as the coating for the optical electronics and energetic materials. First, let me talk about the selective atomic layer depositions. As shown here, um, why we need a selective deposition. First, the killer application here is the integrated circuits. So initially, like the front end FETs, back end of this kind of densely packed interconnected, and also for right now, the three dimensional integrations, we uh, look into a lot of super weirds. We many times we want to uh, place around with very tiny scales. So here it shows the regular processing. So you do the first patterning by EUV or DUVs. And later on, 
if you want to really align your structures, so you have to do the deposition of the thin films, apply your photo resist, do lithography, do edge, and eventually you have something add on these materials. This is overlays and normally um, it will create a little bit of the, what we call edge placement arrows as shown here. Normally, it's not an issue, but with the scales continue shrinking down, the lines are getting closer and closer. The issue is starting to come because if you just have like a, a few nanometer of lines, and if you have like a less a nanometer edge placement arrow, EPE, then you might have to get shorting here. So the way to avoid this and also increase or improve the yield of the uh, this kind of advanced manufacturing is that you can add some layers on top of that. So instead of doing all this, we do the selective deposition. You just get one step to replace all these kind of multiple ones, and then you get self-aligned structure without too much of the troubles on the edge placement arrows. So in order to get that kind of selective depositions, we regularly have like two main approaches. One is that actually developed a while ago, while I was a PhD, we have to apply this kind of what we call self assembly monolayers, this kind of inhibitors selectively on certain areas and then left it the other places to be able to selectively deposit it. And now we are more focused on understanding the surfaces to give it like the inherent ASD growth. So from that, I'm starting to talk a little bit about the templated ASD. As I mentioned that when I was running my PhDs, uh, we actually starting the effect of this kind of surface monolayer. Either they grow on oxide or they grow on hydride. And we investigate the chain lens, the time, and everything in order to achieve the completely deactivation. And at that time, we will be able to apply this technology to obtain this kind of self-aligned growth of either metals or oxide. And this actually aroused a great interest um, from both academia and industry. And afterwards, the quite of uh, works in the recent years, and as shown on the right, basically uh, last year, applied materials, they starting to introduce their ASD tools and also in our laboratories, we are already being able to push the limit of this kind of self-assemble monolayers down to uh, a few nanometer scales. And as you can see on the right, basically we have this less than 15 nanometer pitches. And on the SiO2, we'll be able to selectively deposit the aluminum oxide. And while we can completely intact of the coppers as shown here. So basically, this is already very close to the industrial applications. And uh, uh, I look forward to see uh, the mass productions with this kind of technique. But like us as researchers from universities, we are looking into the next step. So um, when I went back to China, we starting to looking into whether we will be able to achieve like this kind of one step. We utilize the surfaces as like shown here, right, on the, on the right, basically uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Pauling mentioned that uh, God make the bulk and the surface was invented by the devil. Definitely the surface a lot more complicated than we can really control it. But the good thing is um, ALD, ALE, this kind of atomic layer processes, they strongly relies on the surfaces. So we will be able to play around with the surface to uh, achieve this kind of um, selective processes. And here, basically, I list several of the recent developments in this field. But uh, uh, compared to the template ASC, the inherent one is simpler, relies on the surfaces. So I want to highlight a few of our recent works. First is actually we compare with the surfaces of the metal surface with the oxide surfaces, because this is a sort of universal blocks, building blocks for the semiconductor processes. 
So here, uh, the left is a metal, say platinum, copper, or these kind of metals. And we know like on the metals, the oxygen tends to be absorbed there. And uh, most of this kind of noble metal that tends to dissociate the oxygen very well. We utilize this phenomenon and let the oxygen dissociate and then let the reaction happens. So very easily, or what I should say is that relatively easily, we'll be able to grow the materials on the metal side, but not too much on the oxide because we rely on the initial um, nucleations there. But this process is, is definitely not perfect. Uh, as you can see, we achieve the selectivities around like this not level. We definitely still have certain type of growth on the oxide part. And if we try to really compare with different surfaces, so we should say like the surface electronegativities uh, in the order of like the platinum larger than the copper and definitely larger than oh, this kind of oxide leads to better selective depositions. So next, uh, that is like something in more details compared with the uh, dielectric on dielectric that I show you uh, from the industry applications. Actually, the difficulty here is that, as I just mentioned, that's the deposition on metal side for this kind of uh, precursors are easier compared to the on the oxide. So we have to really to invert these processes. So we started the surface again. That's the way that we have been taught to do. So we can we compare it with the native oxide that's naturally exposed. We compare it with like the um, acid treated one, oxygen treated one, and ozone treated one. And clearly we can see that with more like ozone treated oxidized surfaces, they tend to grow more. So we also study, like use uh, uh, X-ray photo spectroscopy to study the bending energy of the surfaces. We can see that as shown here, basically the amount of like the um, copper two plus stages with copper one and copper zeros, they actually changes significantly from the processes. Having known of that, through the regular mm -hmm. ALD, we actually added one more extra steps ahead of it. We use the ethanol to remove the surface absorbed um, oxide, or we dissolve this kind of naturally absorbed oxide, and then run this kind of ALD processes. The good thing is that as long as you turn it into this kind of copper metals, the processes, if you choose the precursor very well, they starting to be absorbed on this oxide only. Then when you run the second run, the, the byproduct, uh, the co-reactant, either uh, hydrogen, ox uh, either the water or the oxygen, they tend to oxidize the copper surface again. So you have to re reduce the copper again. By doing so, we actually invented this kind of ABC type of AOD processes. Through that, each time when you run one layer, so we do one, cy uh, one cycle of this kind of reduction to achieve a nice removal. And by doing so, we will be able to achieve actually a significant round of this kind of oxide deposition only on the oxide part. And here we basically compare with the different uh, surfaces with different cycles. We also compare it with a lot of literature data. And we can see here that basically we'll only be able to confine our growth of the oxide on the oxide part and without any impact on the copper site. Having said all that, uh, we can also do some selective growth on the metal side but not intact of the oxide if we want to grow what we call metal on metals. So for that, we actually run through the ruthenium deposit on the tungsten, and that we leave the oxide, SiO2, non-packed. And we choose like the different precursors and with a different co-reactant to be able to achieve this kind of ones. 
all of this, we actually have a different substrate, like we have copper and we have the oxide. They are quite different. So we can utilize this kind of uh, surfaces difference to achieve the selective deposition. While men, in some cases, we have chemically similar surfaces, then how we do that? So like here, we actually have a case that we have both oxide. They both terminate with hydroxyl groups. If you run a regular AOD process, you would imagine that, okay, I will have the growth on both sides completely the same. But we actually find out that uh, um, there's some difference as shown on the um, first graph shown on the uh, left. You can see like the hafnium and aluminum they actually been able to survive for up to 200 cycles without the nucleation. We do this with in-situ ellipsometers. While like the silicon oxide, titanium oxide, and manganese oxide they actually follow very well with this kind of linear growth. So what's the difference? We actually try to um, test different temperatures with um, this stops, and it is found that uh, they definitely follow into like two types of surfaces, and it will be able to tune the deposition temperatures to exaggerate this kind of difference. So to understand the mechanism behind that, we run the mass spectrometer and of course crystal microbalance studies. As shown on the left the, for the mass spectrometers, we definitely can see this kind of runs. Basically, the titanium precursors with alkaline line uh, ligands tends to chemically absorb on this kind of acidic SiO2 surfaces. And they actually go through a hydrogen transfer reactions between the surface hydroxyl and precursor molecules. Through this kind of hydrogen transfer reactions, the ligands of the precursors are dissolved into the ethanol um, molecules, and the remaining intermediate is strongly uh, chemically dissolved on the surfaces. And this initiated the following nucleation. So these two studies give us a kind of pathway how this has been happened. The hydrogen transfer mechanism during the AOD shows this is a dominant factor for this kind of selective depositions. Because like for the aluminum and the hafnium substrate, the hydrogen transfer reactions is relatively got blocked. So we do not see the growth and sort of get the selective de deactivation. Well, for the, all the rest of the surfaces, they can grow linearly. Um, try, try to verify this kind of um, mechanisms. So we run the density function of theory calculations with the collaborators next to the groups. So it is found that basically the inherent selectivity definitely go through this kind of surface acidity differences. Uh, we actually summarize the materials difference on this uh, right figures. As you can see, like the SiO2 magnesium oxide, they, have, they are being called like the acidic oxide. Well, for the um, Red side, they're more towards the basic oxide. For the basic oxide, the hydrogen um, transfer processes sort of get forbidden. And through that, we actually being able to differentiate two hydroxyl group terminated surfaces. While on the acidic oxide, we'll get normal growth. While for the basic oxide, we actually confine the growth. But one thing that I definitely should mention is that this is very much depend on the precursor's choice because this kind of precursors, they react with the surface through this kind of mechanism. And if we change another type of titanium precursors, they may not completely follow with that. So this is very much surface dependent processes. So uh, just now I show you like the metal on dielectric dielectric on dielectric, metal on metal, and the different two dielectric differences. All this serves just like Lego, just, just to build up all this kind of building blocks. So we utilize in this kind of technique, uh, being able to apply for, for example, the backhand interconnect uh, as shown earlier, 
And we also apply this for some kind of guided um, optics. Uh, we just select to pass away to a certain side of that. The reason for me to say that is that with the continual downscaling to Moore's laws and or beyond the Moore's law, they have tons of the three-dimensional integrations with different new materials, different surfaces, and the selective process definitely serves a great role that help us to building up these three-dimensional structures. It's just like building up of the Legos. So the next, beyond the, the semiconductor type of building up the Legos, what else it can be done? So the next application that in my group runs a lot is for this kind of heterogeneous catalysis. Because this is very similar to the above one, we actually adding each atoms on the surfaces. So for the heterogeneous catalysis, we know it's actually very important for the chemicals, for the environment, for the energies, like the um, certain kind of uh, synthesis and to reduce the CO um, and also for a lot of hydrogen cars, we have to utilize the catalysis. And for a lot of this kind of noble metal catalysis, they share uh, similarities. First of all, the stability issues. Um, they tend to get agglomerated through ages because they're so tiny. So we want to really confine them and really try to anchor them. That's like us um, strategies for the stability. The other one is for the activities. Well, the activity is definitely a very important factors for the heterogeneous catalysis and how we can promote it that interfaces definitely play an important role. And the third one is a selectivity. We know for a lot of chemical synthesis, it may happen very well on one side, but the side reaction may happen on the other side. As I just show you about the selective deposition, definitely this kind of things would help to improve the selectivity. So the next, I'm going to show you a few cases how we do the selective processes on these nanostructures and how it applies for the catalysis. So um, shape matters, composition matters, size matters, and also structure matters. That's how we play around with the atoms on this kind of catalysis. <coughs> so for the... Um, for the metal catalysis, first of all, we do this kind of structure designs. As shown here, we have the design strategies. Either we actually form this kind of fence structures around it, or we do the cover uh, just like a notch to cross it. So for the first one, we utilize the strategies I showed earlier, the template one. So we have this plantain atoms, plantain nanoclusters on this kind of uh, aluminum support. So we can apply this kind of uh, file, octadecyl file molecules, selectively binding to these metals only. With the, the bindings, we can grow the oxide just around it to form this kind of selective deposition. And later on, we can remove the uh, self thermal monolayers. By doing so, we'll be able to form this kind of, as shown here, the metals, just like nanoparticles. It's just like a basketball in the basket. Well, if we do not run this kind of selective processes, you actually would form this kind of completely coatings, and then you lose your um, catalytic performance. So here are some proofs basically showing um, this two step of selectivity, basically, we only have this to passivate with the metals, but not grow on the oxide. And then later on, the ALD processes is only on the surrounding areas, but not on top of that. And here are the proofs. And with this kind of structures, we are being able to achieve this kind of ball in the basket. The good thing is that once you form the structures, you achieve like two good things. The first thing is, you sort of anchor the structure. So with this running at high elevated temperatures, they are not really agglomerated significantly. They almost keep the regular size as shown here. You just see a little bit of the shift 
the, the, the red curve is just a little bit of right, right shift. Well, if you do not do this kind of coatings or anchoring structures, the particle will completely just goes to much larger one as shown here. Their size has been listed here. The second good thing is that because you form this kind of metal oxide interfaces and this metal oxide are sort of active and that improve the activities as well. Similarly, we can run this for like another type of metals like the gold, which is good catalysis, but very, uh, very easy to get agglomerated. So we utilize similar ways and also we can use ALD to control not only the size, but also the height, how to confine in the, the metal nanoparticles. And for that, we obtain this kind of gold titanium uh, composite structures. The, uh, the third cases that I want to show you, the third and fourth, are utilizing the inherent selective processes. Basically, we are doing this kind of uh, inherent depositions on one facet, but not intact the others. This has been achieved through the different binding energies and reactions initially. And what it happens is that they have a very big uh, barrier differences on the uh, plantum 111 and plantum 100 because they are different. So we actually being able to cover like one side of it, like 111 initially, but leave the 100 untacked. By doing so, we created this kind of knot on that. The good thing is that it helped to stabilize the particles and at the same time, it enhances activities. So similarly, if we choose other type of like metal oxide uh, and with different co-reactant, we will be able to selectively coatings on this kind of edges. And once you coat it on the edges, you form this nice interfaces and also you stabilize the metal particles. So all of these four examples, that we showing you how the selective AOD help to improve the stability of the nanoparticles. Uh, the next, uh, uh, I will use like a, uh, a few examples to show you how we can do the structural changes to obtain this kind of uh, enhanced activities. So this one is that we utilize this uh, self assemble monolayers. layers. We just run it very quickly like just a few seconds, then it will leave a few pinholes. Through the pinholes, we will be able to form these kind of core shell structures. If you don't do this kind of pinholes, actually we'll get some like newly nucleated small um, nuclides. So you are not only obtain the core shell structure, but also obtain some like new second type of materials. Like when you do run ALD, the quotient of materials you obtain is like as accurate as to like one monolayers. So doing so, we obtain this kind of structures and the processes enable is good activities with minimum plantum amounts. So that's actually showing you how we utilize the template method. This uh, slide, uh, I want to show you is that we can use the inherent one as well. And uh, um, here we do the bifunctional ruthenium on the plantum nanoparticles. The good thing is that uh, um, the surfaces with ruthenium and the plantum for certain phases, they have a really good match. While for the other surfaces, they actually have a higher degree of lattice mismatch. So, we uh, utilize this kind of strain differences to be able to obtain the selective absorptions on certain facets while leave the other ones now intact for the first few layers. And that give us good enough uh, performances because after that, we obtain not only the core shots, but also the facet differences. Um, the third example is that by utilizing a different co-reactant, we will be able to lower the process temperatures and it helps us to be able to absorb on um, certain facets and we'll be able to obtain like kind of single atom, uh, single atom catalysis. 
But if we do not uh, running this kind of uh, decreased temperature, if we run it at like elevated ones, you actually get coatings and depositions all of the places. And all of this showing that the selective processes, you have the um, like the like temperature, partial pressure, and your chemistry, all of those can help you to obtain different kinds of structures that you want. And all of this will help you to build up the atomic scale nanostructures. And all these type of structures give you not only the activity enhanced, but also sometimes it has some activity enhancement as well. The last example that I want to show is that by utilizing this kind of um, inherent selective phases, phased selective depositions, we'll be able to cover like a certain facet of this palladium, like palladium 111 has been covered. Then we leave the other facet completely open and we will be able to obtain a very good selective benzyl alcohol oxidation reaction. We don't get too much of the byproduct when we get really pure um, and like end products. So like for the first part that uh, uh, I try to summarize, basically for the area selective depositions, we rely on the different uh, like the surfaces, like you have like uh, one zero zero one 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 or like the edges, we rely on the different uh, metal organic metal precursors like different center metal metals, different ligands and different co-reactants. All those all of those will help us to obtain uh, different structures, and with that we'll be able to design the catalysis down to the atomic accuracies and try to. Uh, help us to understand the mechanism better and also to obtain a better catalysis. And for the uh, different materials, uh, we have to really understand it you know, um, more towards like the temperature, nucleation delay, etc. And for that, we create a nucleation models that uh, including the nucleus generation, expansion, diffusion, and also correlate all of those with our experiment data to predict the nucleation. And we hope that with this kind of models, we'll be able to predict um, and also stretch us to the limit of the selective processes. So um, with all of that, we build up, uh, we actually have the parameters of the temperature, we have the parameters of the pressures, and we can utilize either the chemistry, surface and layers, or using the physical field assisted, like the plasma or whatever else. And we can add some like a layer of the etching or removal step to remove the extra ones. For all of this, we can pick whatever we want to, uh, to obtain a very good control of the selective deposition and utilizing those to build up the three-dimensional structures. And then next, I'm going to talk about the atomic level processes for emerging applications. If saying what above shows you is more towards uh, utilizing uh, the fundamental film type of process to narrow it to the three-dimensional control, for the emerging applications, we actually utilizing the film. Many times we utilize the film properties. Like uh, the first one that is very close uh, to the industrial uh, application is related with uh, optoelectronics. Not only for the displays, but also for the photovoltaic. And we already see the industrials adopted some of the AOD method there, they actually help to do a good encapsulation for the flexible and stretchable materials because AOD tends to give you like a pinhole free materials. And also it gives you a very good surface passivation and very good uniform uh, films that actually help you to obtain higher mobility, balance, balance all the carriers, etc. 
So I want to show you a few examples from the laboratories. The first one is functional layers. I think that is probably the one that with most of the publication that you can search from literatures. Like for our groups, we are actually working on the proof sketch uh, displays, um, and uh, we utilize the atomic layer deposition to make the uh, whole transport, uh, trans transport layers and electron transport layers. And also, uh, when we're dealing with some of the proof skies, we create the surface um, passivations for that to enhance the stabilities. And also, uh, we run in similar ones to the photovoltaic and for the perovskite photovoltaic, but that is like a, the industrial collaborated project. So um, some of the data I could not show here. So the second one is towards the passivation. And uh, in my opinion, I think AOD is definitely a, one of the perfect encapsulation material uh, processes that has been uh, exist so far. It's actually good for rigid uh, coatings, and it's also good for foldable, flexible, and even stretchable um, encapsulations. So here, um, what we definitely have done is that uh, for the regular OLED displays, we can really minimize the encapsulation layers with AOD processes. And we can run the organic, inorganic, this kind of nano laminates to decrease and increase the flexibility and decrease the thickness. And for the stretchable uh, ones, we actually running with a process called atomic layer infiltration. Instead of making a ceramic layers, we actually making them more like kind of this kind of cross-linking materials that would survive for a little bit of stretching. So here, uh, basically showing a few examples that have been uh, performed. Um, the first one is actually uh, the AOD composite layers with the industrial uh, PECVD uh, silicon nitride. And without this kind of uh, AOD processes, you actually starting to obtain this kind of uh, OLED structures being deteriorated through the waters quickly. And with only the AOD, sometimes you get good performance, but many times you'll get fillings because it's too thin and like a small particle would completely de destroy it. So the good composite film is definitely a thin layer of the AOD. It serves like a good encapsulation and then you have a, a PECVD nitride and these two layers would help to um, minimize the stress levels. So with the ALD MLD, we'll be able to obtain this kind of uh, organic, inorganic nano laminates, and that will enhance the flexibility, but at the same time maintain a good encapsulation. And for the stretch ball ones, we do this, uh, what we call atomic layer infiltration, in which you let the processes completely go through the polymers, not like here, like here, you actually have to do some treatment to, to make sure that the precursor won't penetrate through the PDMS, not through the polymers. But here, you actually want the precursor to go into it to, to, fill, to form this kind of cross linkings. So the process is, is what we call the AOI. It's a little bit different. And by doing so, we actually being able to stretch the stuff but still maintain a very good encapsulation properties. And uh, um, all of those was showing on the encapsulations, but many times the encapsulation is not only on the uh, display or the microscopic um, ranges. It can actually go down to the pixels or even go to the phosphor materials themselves. So here uh, we actually pass the rate with the pro, pro sketch um, quantum dots through the ligand exchange. Like here, it's actually like selective passivation because we don't want to replace the ligands, but we want to passivate the point that hasn't been covered. And we run like this kind of um, plasma processes to coat it with that. And sometimes we run the composite structures to to code it, all of that would help to enhance uh, stabilities. 
And uh, this is actually a work that we collaborate uh, with the Heinkoven University of Technologies. And we can actually send this, um, we, we actually synthesize the particle, uh, the quantum dot there, and then we do the plasma enhanced uh, uh, AOD processes with extremely low temperature. And through that, we can mail this stuff from Netherlands to China for like two weeks without much of degradation. And uh, this is normally very hard to believe initially. And with uh, this kind of mild plasma processes, we do not deteriorate all this kind of ligand, but at the same time, passivate the surface of non-reacted uh, places. And similarly, we can utilize in, um, the, this kind of quantum dots. And once we encapsulate it very well, we will be able to adopt them um, with the LED chips. And uh, it can actually go up to 100 milliamp at 50 degrees Celsius without, and it can survive it for a long time without the degradation. This actually helps to, to improve the stability significantly. And it is not only for the perovskite quantum dots, it's also good for like um, this kind of lead type or uh, Indian phosphite type of quantum dots. We actually adopt this technology and also integrate it in the phone and it's showing the good um, color gamut and also very good stabilities through the long time of the usage. It can also be applied for the organic luminescent powders. These are the like the violet pigment. It helps uh, to enhance the, the, the color of the pigment. And also it has been uh, utilizing for the phosphorus encapsulation. Like here, we run like two steps of the, the self-assembled structures with the AOD processes. And it's actually helping to form extremely uh, water repel, uh, extremely hydrophobic coatings to make sure that this um, normally very easy to get uh, wet um, powders to be able to survive for the application site. So the encapsulation uh, of the AOD definitely found a lot of applications in the optoelectronics. And beyond that, it also found a great application in stabilizing of the energy materials, for example, uh, the solid propylate and for the um, lithium ion cathode, the precious metal particle agglomeration, et cetera. So here I just, uh, due to the time limit, I just show you a few examples about uh, the encapsulation of the energetic materials. So here is um, the aluminum hydride materials. Um, it's actually a good um, hydrogen storage materials. It can be used for the um, a lot of um, like the good applications. Uh, but uh, as you know, that the hydrogen probably will easy to escape, especially if you store it for a while. To, to help doing so, actually a passivation or a thin layer of passivation becomes very important. You don't want to lose the energetic part, the, the volume energetic part of the uh, hydrogen. But at the same time, you want to keep it to be sealed very well. So um, for this kind of things, we do a low temperature uh, AOD processes. Uh, if we run it, then you can see the surface will be sort of intact. But if you don't do too much of the coatings, you actually will see the hydrogen release and you leave all, all of the holes on the surfaces. And similarly, we can run this for like a lot of metal um, nanoparticles and, uh, with the coatings. And you, if you select the good coating part, it actually be able to survive when you throw it into the hot waters. And that would, actually help you to keep all, all this kind of energetic materials stabilized for a long time storage. And similarly, this kind of ideas can be applied for the lithium ion cathode material. And this has become one of a very um, active research field in China recently, because we, we basically have a, a big drive for the electrical vehicles. 
and for a lot of high energy, uh, like or the high cobalt materials, we have to high nickel uh, materials. We have to really passivate it very well. Otherwise, uh, it's very easy to get wetting, and also when it's react with the electrolyte, it tends to have many side reactions. So for this, we definitely found that with the proper coating of the surfaces, with just like a few astroms, it helped to stabilize and let the materials can be run for longer time. Um, um, this is also basically showing how we can use in the, um, this kind of the processes to keep uh, ALD, we, we, we actually keep the ALD to as a small single atoms in the films. We run this through what we call the, the redox coupled uh, AOD process. And then we can really embed it a small amount of the materials inside of the layers. So if you remember that in the very beginnings, I mentioned the good things for the processes is like we can control the thickness very well. We can really achieve good uniformity and conformal coatings. And also we can tune the composition very well. And like here, uh, these two cases is that we can utilize AOD to compound to uh, really tuning the percentage of the in, in, uh, incoming, uh, like this kind of metal um, atoms. And also we can construct uh, single atoms or this kind of uh, metal nanoclusters very well. So um, the last is that basically utilizing the similar ways we will be able to form a very nice um, plantinum zinc um, on the carbon, this kind of um, catalysis. And this catalysis is good for the fuel cell applications. And why we want to do the IOD coating and then convert it is that we can decrease amount of the plantium and also we form this kind of plantium zinc alloys very well. If you do the uh, wet synthesis, normally you will get much larger of the particles. And uh, if we do like this, we can really control the composition and control the thickness very well, very accurately. And this is basically showing how we can uh, apply that one for achieving a atomic control of the composition and the structures. And uh, the last uh, is that uh, all of the emerging applications, they're very different to semiconductor industry. So uh, as I have shown you, you can see a lot of nanoparticles, a lot of powders, and also for the photovoltaic displays, you end up with a large scales. And we know like for the uh, um, semiconductor processes, we often have these vacuum chambers and you run for the uniformity. But if you compare with this kind of emerging applications, you often have other requirements. First of all, they have enormous surface areas. This like uh, 45, uh, 450 uh, millimeter diameter, like the, the, the 60 inch structures, normally you just have 0 0.10 meter square. But like for uh, like powders, you often get like uh, tens or hundreds meters squares per gram or even larger. So they actually give, bring a lot of different questions for uh, the nano manufacturing. And for the uh, displays or like a photo of attack, you tend to run it with large scales and also fast speed and cheaper. Like for this, you definitely relies on very delicate structures, no particles, very good control. But the rest, we are dealing with like precursor utilization, deposition rates, large surface areas, efficiencies, and many times the cost. So the challenges would come a little bit different. So with that, we actually run a couple of uh, reactor studies for our own uh, research. Like for this kind of particles, they're, if they're really tiny, we have to 
find the forces to uh, break the softer agglomerate. So here we actually utilizing the rotary fluidized battery reactors, and we control the different rotating speed. And by doing so, we are able to achieve this kind of particle coating instead of the agglomerate coatings. And this is very important for a lot of like the energetic materials application because we rely on the enormous surface areas. We don't want to lose the surface areas for the coatings. And if we want to scale up, and we if we have like larger sizes here, we actually utilizing the ultrasound vibrated assisted fluid bath LED reactors that we designed here in house, and with uh, um, tuning the ultrasound, we'll be able to separate the uh, the, the the agglomerate. But more importantly, we actually enhance the mass transport. Um, it would help us to shrink the process time significantly, as shown here. Um, if without the, the that process, we have to like over like 350 seconds for one cycle of a kilogram of coating. And if we do this kind of ultrasound, we can shorten it to much shorter time. So that actually would be very beneficial, but it eventually you have to know the surface reactions and the mass transport there. And for the large surface areas, we run this kind of what we call special, spatially separate atomic layer deposition. It enables us to run with continuous film depositions. And it also have a great potentials for like larger than a meters and continuous uh, depositions. But for that, the difficult thing is that you have to like as shown here, you actually basically have the, this uh, substrate moving back and forth. Um, you have a very tiny gaps between the precursors and your substrate. Then you have to make sure that you are in the this kind of surface self-limited uh, regimes and to make sure you are in the AOD regimes, but at the same time, you want to improve your efficiency. And for that, uh, we have to utilizing a lot of simulations to guide us to make good designs, uh, find good parameters, and eventually design the good tools to help us to obtain that. So uh, that's actually the ending slides of me to showing you actually through the years we run for the uh, particle AOD tools and uh, the spatial AOD tools to, in order to meet a lot of emerging applications. And here are some of the publications that I have discussed today. So basically, uh, through the atomic layer deposition, we have the selective AOD related ones to help us to uh, form a lot of atomic accuracy structures. And also for a lot of emerging applications, we actually have to consider uh, how we can really run the process very well and what kind of instruments would allow us to run those to be able to do so. So uh, the last uh, um, that I want to really um, share with you is that uh, the challenges and the opportunities moving forward with atomic placement. Definitely, as you can see, this is an extremely surface sensitive uh, processes and uh, how to design and the synthesis of the precursors would become a very important role. And that's why I actually collaborate with a lot of organic uh, chemists. Uh, they would guide us to find the good precursors and also um, sometimes can help us design good precursors for high reactivity and selectivities. And for the process development, it become more and more complicated nowadays. The machine learning methods are definitely effective ways to accelerate de developing the processes and precursor selections. And for the technology side, I would think the atomic layer etching and the deposition. I don't talk, uh, I, although I haven't talked a lot of the etchings, I think etching is as important as depositions in order to obtain this kind of. Uh, three-dimensional structures and in the applications. And it will actually help us to build a lot of atomic scale and quantum devices. The design of the equipment for the applications in the high volume manufacturing so will definitely 
um, a key for a lot of emerging application. And finally, all of that, we have to know them from fundamentals. So a lot of in situ and ex situ experiments and characterizations, I believe is definitely very important. So uh, the molecular and atomic world is definitely fascinating. Uh, we definitely motivate a lot through the applications, but it is really critical in the fundamentals. So with that, I sort of end my talk today. So this is actually, uh, this year is our university's 70th year's um, anniversary. So we wrote a sort of perspectives for the ALD enabled advanced manufacturing is go to the downscales, flexibilities and post Morse laws for that. Thank you very much for all your attentions and I really look forward to the discussions. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Professor Cheng, for an uh, yeah excellent talk. You really have brought ALD to a to a new level. Your contributions are really amazing. Um, before we go uh, to the discussions, uh, I saw that we have a question from the audience. So I would like to ask that question first. This is a question from Kai Tao from Sejiang University, and uh, Kai Tao says, "Dear Prof Cheng." Excellent presentation, very inspiring. I have a question. What is your opinion about molecular uh, layer deposition? Or have you ever tried molecular organization in your system? Thank you very much. That's definitely a very interesting question and very nice question. Um, in my opinion, molecular layer deposition is sometimes similar to atomic layer deposition. They sometimes can share the similar equipment similar surface chemistry. Um, I actually run molecular deposition um, in my labs as well. Um, but sometimes I just found that because I'm dealing with a lot of uh, those kind of uh, organic molecules instead of the metal organic ones, they have like a lower vapor pressure, uh, lower reactivity. So the growth rate is much slower compared to a lot of AOD process. But with the, the chemist's help, probably we'll be able to help. And then we'll be able to really building up not only atoms, but also molecules. Thank you. OK, thank you. Then uh, then I think we can continue with uh, uh, our discussion. And I would like to start or invite uh, Dr. Wan, our ex-challenger, uh, to kick off the discussion. Hi, Professor Chen. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And your work is very impressive. I think your systematic uh, innovation on ALD bring the, the, the area uh, to the new level. So um, my question is, uh, um, I'm very impressed by the uh, using ALD to uh, build some nanoparticles, uh, for example, the co-shell structure, and to functionalize it uh, uh, using the uh, platinum, some, something like that. So my question is comparing, uh, comparing with the ALD and the VAT chemi chemical method or solution-based uh, method, uh, can you offer some uh, opinion on what is advantages of ALD process? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, definitely, I think they have two advantages um, compared with the wet. First of all, we know like um, for a lot of uh, um, uh, vapor phase processes, they do often have better control uh, than the wet. And that's why for a lot of uh, laboratory work, for example, the proskite uh, solar cells, normally they run in the lab a wet and then when they want to go uh, to the uh, like the high volume manufacturing they go to the vapor phase because for vapor phase you often have better control and especially for the ALD you will be able to control the core shell for example down to like each shell is like a monolayer thickness and it's very uniform that's actually is one of the advantages the second advantage is I would say is that um, Many of these kind of studies sometimes uh, involved with the structure 
um, activity relationship. And with the ALD, uh, you actually will be able to build a relatively um, homogeneous structures very well. And that actually help you to build up this kind of structure property relation better than like when you assess it randomly, then you have different size uh, distribution and different structures. Then, uh, so fundamentally, it helps you to understand from property point of view, it's actually uh, very good. But definitely, I would say, at least at this moment, it's much more expensive than the wet synthesis. So we have to rely on the real application to, to reduce the cost. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chen. Yeah. No, thank you, uh, Dr. Wang, for an uh, excellent question. So maybe we can now uh, uh, go, go to our next uh, panel member, uh, Professor Duan from Hunan University. Oh, OK. OK, thank you, Professor. It's a uh, wonderful talk. So actually, I have a lot of questions, but uh, maybe I can ask one or two uh, questions first. So, uh, so when I do something, I always uh, like to ask the question about the theoretical limit. For example, you uh, uh, in your last several slides, you you mentioned that there there would be a trade-off between the uh, deposition rate uh, and the uniformity and the uh, precursor uh, utilization. But uh, what the maximum uh, deposition rate theoretically actually, for, for example, come uh, to uh, we uh, we guarantee the uniform uh, uniformity. Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah, uh, especially from the manufacturing point of view. Um, so the theoretical um, speed, I would say, is that how fast it can be absorbed um, on the surface. Because uh, it's actually, I, I would think it, we can divide it into two cases. One case is that the reaction is extremely fast, but the transport is slow then the transport would probably play the most important part. So you just want to uh, accelerate your transport. And with that, uh, we normally feel that uh, the absorption is like within like the milliseconds and the reaction sometimes faster than that, then you, you will be able to obtain that. So for that, uh, we actually in our lab, we obtain like um, more than hundred nanometer per minute growth for the AOD process. That's pretty high. And that's actually the way we try to push to the limit. At the same time, um, in order to keep uh, them to be uniform, um, you need to completely make sure you don't have CVD components and you don't really, um, you, you actually have enough time to let the, the, the byproduct goes away, et cetera. And that sometimes is, I, I would say it's a trade-off between, between that. The next phase is that if you have a very uh, low reactive precursors, then I think sometimes temperature, partial pressure, and all these concentrations help it to, to enhance the speed. And for that, normally, um, if you want to achieve the nice uh, uniform films, you have to give it enough time to let it uh, react and, uh, uh, and, and so on, so that. So, and that's why, although there is a, like on the periodical table, we have many materials have been developed for the ALD. Uh, I think a half of the people are using like the aluminum oxide because it's like perfect. It's no matter how you grow, you always obtain a very good uh, uniformities and faster speed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Crystal, may I have one more question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, so, uh, Professor Chen, so I have another question is that, so is it possible to deposit like a uh, uh, polymer layer uh, on the nanoparticles? Uh, because you, you know, the materials you mentioned actually basically is inorganic. So, uh, but uh, in, most, in a lot of uh, applications, organic uh, coatings are also very important. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's also a very good question. Um, yes, um, just as the first speak, uh, first question that I got, um, we can do the molecular la layer depositions very well. Um, and it's actually helped you to form this kind of uh, organic shells. 
And if you run a few layers of that, and we can run like a molecular layer deposition, then eventually it's served like a polymer. Um, the, the, the thing is like some of the coatings, um, especially the molecular uh, precursors, mm -hmm. they are they are they relatively have big um, steric hindrance. So in order to obtain a very densely packed um, polymers, sometimes it's still quite challenging. Okay. They are low vapor pressure and also they're big steric hindrance. So sometimes you just cannot get it completely um, mm -hmm. packed uh, one. So that's actually one of the, I believe, uh, issue to prevent uh, uh, is wide application. You know, like uh, when I back into US, when I was a process engineer in Intel, we actually think of using molecular layer deposition to replace some of the photoresist, as you can see, like when you go to yeah. UV or like that one, you want yeah. another one. But the, the hard part is always we cannot get it completely as good as AOD films. So the MLD film is not as good as that one. But that's definitely, I think that uh, with a lot of help from the chemists, we probably be able to obtain good polymer yeah. layers. Thank yeah. you. If we can do that, that would be great. Okay, uh, that's my question. Yeah, I'm also curious. Uh, now we got already a lot of discussion about uh, uh, kind of applications and efficiencies. For industrial processes, I think uh, nowadays they use already 300 millimeter wafers. They are enormous. So how, how homogeneous can ALD be over such enormous surface areas? You make one thing that is one atom layer thick. Yes. How homogeneous is it over the entire 300 millimeters? Uh, for 300 millimeter, it's not a problem at all. It's uh, oh, it's wow. utilizing in the, in the semiconductor industry. Uh, but like if you consider if you have like a uh, one ton of the nanoparticles, one ton of the battery cathode materials, if you want to coat all these balls, they have bigger ball and small ball all homogeneous with that monolayer, that's a challenge. So that's why we have to utilize all the kind of way to, 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 to promote the transport um, and also find the good chemistry to be able to get a good coating. Wow, that's quite amazing. And uh, just now an, uh, another question from the audience dropped in from uh, Yunnan Dai uh, from Shanghai Jiao uh, Tong University. And uh, uh, Johan uh, says, thank you for the inspiring presentation. You just mentioned ALD application in optoelectronics and other areas of materials related research. Is there any other area that ALD finds its new application? Mm. So it's a question meant like that uh, I want to stress some other uh, application. Yes, I think so. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The possible applications or maybe exciting areas uh, that are maybe in its yes. infancy and are really interesting to explore. Yes, actually, there are a lot um, because uh, some of the application really coming from the industry. For example, I match a few applications with the uh, biomedical ones. Uh, some of uh, within um, the digestive system, while some mm -hmm. others, they actually want to find the connection between both and uh, some other materials. So they want to protect uh, some of the metal, implanted metal surfaces um, with like, for example, SiO2 because it's more biocompatible. So mm -hmm. a lot of those things, they tend to, uh, because they don't worry about cost, so they sometimes will think about the AOD. So I would imagine in the future, there's a lot of things related to the bio, uh, biomedical applications. And uh, the other ones that uh, I met is interesting is with the cloth and uh, the contact lenses. Those are trying to um, make sure that the, the coatings help it uh, get uh, um, sort of prevent the 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 the, the the vaccine prevent the uh, prevent the, the all those kind of um, like the dirty materials get into it. That's kind of the application. That's I, I think is it's very interesting, but uh, I personally haven't tried too much. 
No, thank you very much. Then uh, let's move on to our uh, last panel member, uh, Vibu. Um, yeah, lots of actually uh, panels already asked the, the same question. I want to know, but um, so actually I want to know uh, more regarding the uh, the uh, spatial ALD uh, system that you have. Right, you you said you have some of those systems. What are the challenges? Um, well, the, it seems like the process itself seems to be much easier, right, in comparison to the ALD. And um, what you can you can actually help process roll through, but but why is not widely adopted yet? Um, yeah. Any, any comments on that? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a great question. Um, in my opinion, why like for the semiconductor we often run is like a vacuum based uh, temporal process is because those uh, are still the best to help us uh, keep the minimum level of uh, CBD process, minimum level of the particles. And for the spatial ALD, um, I think it's great for, for optoelectronics, for example, solar cells, because sometimes you don't really worry about like too much, um, or say a few uh, small particles, uh, because the, you rely on like the areas, but you, you are consider of the cost. Um, in my opinion, we can run it faster, but still it's in the vacuum condition, uh, non-vacuum condition, and you have all these moving parts. Uh, although we try all the best to uh, control the process, not in the CVD regimes. Sometimes if you consider uh, we only have like a few uh, hundred micron gaps between the uh, head, shower head with the substrate, and if your substrate have some non-uniformities, you actually will run into a non-ideal condition. So with that, you often have to um, deal with those particle issues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, since we were talking a little bit about these kind of uh, optical applications, uh, you, you also showed some interesting results that you could uh, carry out uh, uh, layer deposition, atomic layer deposition, or even quantum dots. And I think these kind of materials, they're normally very you know, very sensitive to, to surface defects and interfacial charge traps. Mm -hmm. And of course, you create a new interface, right? Yes. Uh, and obviously, it works very well. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, how come charge traps uh, and all those kind of unwanted defects are so effectively avoided? Uh, that's definitely a great question. Um, I think uh, it's like um, the quantum dots we are dealing with are uh, most uh, the perovskite quantum dots. And uh, you can think of those in order to stabilize and synthesize those ones. They have all these kind of ligands, organic ligands passivate through. And due to the steric hinges or the process of you sort of um, wash it a few times, you always have some ligands sort of dissolved or going away. So you leave a certain space, but those space would allow those small um, inorganic precursors to penetrate through. And once it come, it's actually have a strong reactance to, to, to binding with the surface. And that will actually help to passivate it very well. But uh, like some other precursor, if they're big size, then the sterile hinges would prevent it to react very well. And that's why we often choose those small molecules to react. Oh, wow. And how important are differences in surface energies? Uh, sometimes you put molecules, uh, sometimes not. I can imagine that uh, the incoming material will have very different yeah, wetting uh, properties if you even, yeah. And those skills can really think along those lines. I'm not even certain. Uh, how do those kind of factors play a role? Yeah, that's a great question. Definitely, I think surface energy plays a huge role on the nucleation part. So mm -hmm. sometimes if they are not easy to nucleate, you have to treat it and convert it to a lower surface energy ones <laughs> to, yeah. to order to, to get it, yes. That, that's a perfect question. Yeah. Um, are there any more other questions from uh, the panel members? 
Yeah, actually, uh, Professor Chen, so uh, I have one more question. So have you ever tried to uh, use uh, atomic, uh, uh, atomic layer deposition to uh, magnetic particles? Because, uh, because uh, yeah, very recently I have uh, such kind of requirement to, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve uniform uh, 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 coatings on magnetic nanoparticles. Yes, yes, they they have uh, this kind of uh, applications for two. Uh, let me think. I I think two pla two two places need this kind of magnetic particle. Yes. One is for this kind of high um high energy uh, high high electric uh transfer high high electric field transfer or whatever. Um, they have to make sure that you have this kind of dielectric coatings very well. To, to sort of separate them. That's what I heard from. Yes, yes. Um, yes, yes. And the second one with the magnetic coatings is they actually do this for the aircraft, uh, especially with some of type of aircraft, you need to make sure that uh, to, to, to sort of shelling certain yes, part yes. without being uh, affected by the external field, whatever. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So to, to use such kind of uh, like uh, uh, dielectric layers to uh, to make sure the magnetic nanoparticles, especially to ma metallic uh, magnetic nanoparticles, uh, insulating. Yes, yes this, uh, this would be uh, uh, very important for a lot of applications. Yes, yes, I I I I actually get in touch with some of the iron coatings uh, for for those kind of ones. Yes. 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 Okay. Thanks. So I think uh, we already had uh, most of the questions and soon you will earn your certificate, but I want to ask one more challenging question. <laughs> we learned a lot about ALB today and we have seen a lot of the applications. We have seen a lot of the challenges. I also now uh, know that tens of thousands of students are likely watching in real time or will uh, watch your presentation later. What would your advice be to those students? Huh. Uh, <laughs> I think um, my advice is that um, I personally really think, as I, I mentioned in the last, that uh, I think those tiny words, the molecular and atomic world is so fascinating. Although we are uh, sort of uh, uh, motivated by a lot of applications, as I said, but the, the most critical side for the students is always, you know, the fundamentals. I think the fundamentals, the fundamental physics, chemistry is definitely the driven forces that we have to know. Um, otherwise, even you apply it, you achieve something, you, you may not be able to repeat it or you may not be able to understand it. I think that's probably my advice. Uh, always go to fundamentals. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. When, uh, when you also mentioned that you have, for instance, a nucleation model, I know how difficult it is to study nucleation phenomena. Yeah. I've studied a little bit in solution, let alone to understand them on the surface. I think those kinds uh, of things are formidable challenges science still has to solve. And also your quote from Pauli, uh, the bulb was created by God, but the surface by the devil. I think that also tells a lot how challenging it is, how interdisciplinary it is, and how fantastic it is. And of course, as a chemist, I really enjoyed every time I saw a molecule on one of your slides. Yeah, you. So I could not agree with you more that uh, it's very important uh, to understand the fundamentals, of, uh, the physics, the chemistry behind the phenomena. Uh, we would like to uh, to understand so they can also be be applied. Otherwise, sooner or later, you will just hit hit a roadblock. Yeah. So what are in this area then some of the most important uh, scientific questions that needs to be answered? Uh, I personally think, um, um, actually, Haojo is here today as well. So um, right now, I think we spend a lot of effort for the deposition, but the removal actually uh, is a very important thing that has been attracting a lot of attention now. 
but still we have a long way to go with uh, removal. And we know that uh, as a semiconductor guy, initially I know etching is often more mysterious than the deposition. So my scientific question, I think in this, this field is, we really will be able to really add and remove atoms by the way we want. I think that's a uh, question that's always uh, in my mind. I think it's going to be very important. I could agree more with you. And I think this is a uh, fantastic moment uh, to stop and to thank you uh, once more for a very interesting uh, lecture and also fantastic discussions. So I am uh, more than happy uh, to give you the certificate, the ICANN X Talk certificate, volume 124. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, all the panelists and uh, X challenges. Yeah, thank you, Professor Chen. Very nice talk, Professor Chen. Thank you. Okay, then I also would like uh, already to make some advertisements for next week's talk. That will be about functional dielectric polymers and electromechanically active devices uh, by Shi Bing Pai from the University of California, Los Angeles. And next week's moderator will be Martin Thuo. And you can see that there is a very good and interesting team of panelists and, and ex challengers. And herewith, I would like uh, then uh, uh, to conclude today's uh, ICANX uh, session. And just the last slide with some of our sponsors. Thank you all and enjoy your weekends.